Okay, so welcome everyone to the last webinar today of the webinar series, An Evidence-Based Approach to Pre-Child Detention and Its Harmonization in Europe. Uh, these webinars were jointly organized by the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience of Maastricht University and uh, the Leiden Law School of uh, Leiden University. Uh, to briefly summarize the aim of these webinars is to provide a critical insight into the current law and practice of pretrial detention. On Monday and yesterday, we have heard from our speakers that custody before trial is being overused and we have seen the depressing uh, statistics. <laughs> While the overuse of pre-child detention is uh, common knowledge, we know much less about its causes. Yesterday, we delved deeper into the legal framework of three national systems and the potential reasons for a excessive use of this measure. In our view, an exhaustive explanation of these trends can, uh, can only rely on an inter inter interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we need to combine black letter law with a comprehensive understanding of the legal and social reality. Already yesterday afternoon, we had a very thought provoking uh, presentation, a series of presentations giving insights on how judges make decisions, how do they assess risks. Uh, um, and, but we need also to unravel the implications of uh, legal and judicial culture to understand how they influence the use of detention before trial. And this is where this last session fits in. Now we'll give the floor to Dr. Doris De Vogt, who will act as our chair uh, today. Doris. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, as mentioned, today's session explores the concept of judicial culture and how it plays a role in the use of pretrial detention, but also its alternatives. Um, what happens here, sorry. I'm very happy to welcome our speakers for today. And I'm also happy to say that this is an all female panel and one that has a strong background in sociology. Our first speaker is Professor Sandra Susan Smith, who is the Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Professor of Criminal Justice at Harvard University. Her areas of interest include urban poverty and joblessness, social capital and social networks, and more recently, the front end of criminal case processing with a particular interest in the short and long-term consequences of pretrial detention and diversion. Sandra is also faculty director of the program in criminal justice policy and management and Carol K, this is difficult, Fortsheimer professor at the Radcliffe Institute. I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, our second speaker, Professor Mary Rogan, is Associate Professor at Trinity College, uh, Dublin, Ireland, and an expert in prison law, human rights, and penal policy making. She has been awarded a prestigious ERC grant to examine the oversight and accountability of prisons. Mary is also a barrister, and she participated in several projects on prison law and pretrial detention. Finally, our third speaker is Dr. Hilde Wermink, who is an associate professor at Leiden Law School and an expert on the sentencing process and legitimacy and how various actors in the sentencing process use their discretionary powers. She has won a prestigious Veni grant from NVO to study the effects of imprisonment on the further life course. So before I give the floor to this panel, let me set some rules of engagement. They were given to me. Each of our speakers will have about 20 minutes to present and then we will go to discussions. For those of you that attend the webinar, please leave your questions at the comment section as they come to you and we will pick them up after all presentations. To have a more coherent and productive discussion, we asked our speakers to reflect on three questions or statements. Question one, alternatives to pretrial detention measures mean less impact on the rights of individuals. So this is more a statement to react to. Question two, does judicial culture, as you understand it, impact the use of alternative measures and how? Question three, what would you change in the way authorities approach or perceive pretrial detention and alternatives to limit negative impact on individuals and society? So over to our first speaker, Professor Smith, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Doris. Um, and I have to tell you, I rarely uh, state the title uh, for my uh, my professorship because I find it way too difficult to, to do myself. And so I don't want you to feel badly about uh, having difficulties uh, pronouncing it. So <clears throat> 
Uh, what I'd like to do is to talk about uh, pretrial detention and bail in the context of the US. So I'll give a few um, stats about where things stand and what this means in terms of the cost to individuals, their families and societies before um, getting into addressing the three questions um, that uh, Dr. Vakti, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Doris um, mentioned. Um, so first we should start by saying that, you know, of the roughly 2.3 million people who are currently incarcerated in the US. And so this doesn't count the folks who are on probation, parole and other parts of the system, which then constitutes almost 7 million people. So of the roughly 2.3 million people who are currently incarcerated in the US, about a half a million or 20% are defendants who are being held in our nation's jails, local jails, um, uh, local, na our nation's jails. Um, that totals about 3,283 local jails across, across the country. Um, uh, okay, so what we know is that this, this is about 23% um, of the people who are locked up, um, all told, two thirds of those people who are locked up in jails are people who have not been convicted of any crime whatsoever. They're awaiting case adjudication, they're awaiting um, trial. Most of these defendants will be released within one day um, or uh, within uh, at the day of arraignment or within um, one week um, of being arrested and detained. But on average, people are held in pretrial detention for about um, uh, 26 days, a little over three weeks. Now, of course, the range here is huge. Um, there. Uh, uh, in in um, prior years in New York City, for instance, some of the boroughs of New York City had people had average stays of at least a year, and so we should be very mindful about the the lengths of stays that people are. Um, that people have in jail in the US and the consequences of that, which I hope to, to discuss um, a little bit later. What we see is that there's been a dramatic change over the past 30 years in the percentage of folks who are being held without conviction in our nation's jails. That's dramatically increased since 1990. Um, at this point, the majority of folks, um, about two thirds, as I indicated before, um, are being held without having been convicted of any crimes. And this totals between 20 and 25% of, of the total number of people who are being um, held in the nation's jails and prisons overall. So what typically happens is that, you know, the, someone gets arrested, they're booked and charged, and then they go to arraignment where um, a, a series of decisions are made. Um, in some cases, people are released on their own recognizance. That would be the non-financial release. This tends to be about 24% of the population. Again, variations across, across state and even within state. Um, about 4% are denied bail altogether. They're con considered to be either flight risks or way too dangerous um, to be let out um, in, uh, um, um, to the public. And then you have the remaining figure um, of those who are eligible for bail, of those who are eligible for bail, um, um, uh, 38% essentially are able to pay um, to get out um, on bail. Another 34% are held for longer because they're too poor to pay. As we know in the US, um, the, the, we tend to uh, put into detention, we, we actually tend to bring into the penal system altogether, the poorest of the poor, um, people who are arrested as much for being offensive to the broader society than they are for having committed any um, um, crime of um, any significance. Um, and so what we know to have happened over the past 30 years is that there's been a, a, a pretty substantial increase in the reliance on bail for release. Um, in 1990, significantly fewer uh, people were released on bail. We rely much more heavily on release without bail, one's own recognizance. Um, as you can see with the, the, the chart on the the right, regardless of offenses, there's been a, a pretty dramatic, a substantial increase in the percentage of those who are both held on bail, but also released on bail. Um, so we rely far more heavily on especially the money bail system in order to get released than we had in, the, in prior years. Um, and so if we were to, to look um, overall, take a step back and look overall at what it is that we're doing, what we know is about 74% of people in city and county jails are being held pretrial. Um, the median bond um, for, a felon, for a felony offense is 10,000. Keep in mind though, if you are poor, having a thousand dollar bail bond would be too, um, uh, too expensive, too much for you to be able to um, 
to pay in order to get out. And so we know a substantial number of, the, of, the, of folks who are poor are being held in jail on bonds as low as $500, in some cases, $100. Um, so bail, cash bail is, is having a substantial effect on whether or not people are able to be released. Um, and this is even for low risk, low, risk, low level um, um, uh, offenders um, or uh, defendants. Um, people who likely would not um, commit a new crime if they were released um, and would likely show up to their court hearings as well if they were released. And we have a, a growing body of research to show that this is the case. The yearly income tends to be fairly low, especially for those who are women, which helps to explain why it is they, they, it's so difficult for them to get out if they um, are assessed bail. Um, the percentage of women who can't afford bail who have minor children um, upwards of two thirds, and the percentage of pretrial po population that is black um, is 43%. So disproportionately black, also disproportionately, disproportionately Latino. Um, uh, and so what we have learned is that the share of the jail population since 1983 um, caused by pretrial detention itself is 63%. Uh, so when we talk about mass incarceration in the US, we're talking uh, where uh, part of that story is the story about the increased reliance on pretrial detention in part through our increased reliance on the cash bail system itself. Uh, so, of course, the problem with jails, I mean, this would perhaps not be such an issue if jails weren't such horrible places, but they are extraordinarily problematic problematic places to be um, um, in absolute and in relative terms. And this is not just because, as Sykes said in 1958, um, people incarcerated in jails lack liberty, autonomy, sexual relations, and ability to communicate with people on the outside. Um, the, the suffering that happens within the context of jails go well beyond this. And some of my more recent research um, that where I interview um, uh, people who have spent time in our in jails in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Houston, Chicago, and Louisville, Kentucky, um, actually in, in many ways are, are consistent with what it is that we have known from prior research. And, and that is that because of poor and unstable funding, jails tend to employ staff who are underpaid and poorly trained. Um, that uh, people are housed in facilities that are often unsafe, unsanitary, and they lack adequate space for everyone. So overcrowding tends to be a problem. That is often the norm. Um, Jails offer limited, if any, kind of programming to occupy or engage the minds um, and bodies of detainees. The rules and regulations are inconsistently enforced, but punitively sanctioned for noncompliance. Um, this, of course, makes um, daily life unpredictable and volatile. Um, jails, of course, are breeding grounds, and we, we learned this more, uh, more in the last year than we probably thought about it before, are breeding grounds um, for the spread of infectious disease. This is also a place that is extraordinarily violent, um, both in terms of the threat of violence, where people, people um, are um, live with while in jail, but also the actual experience of being acted upon violently, both by other inmates, but importantly, also by uh, jail staff. And jails also provide healthcare and other essential uh, ser social services that are meager at best. Um, and this, of course, is a distressing reality, given that people in um, jails are a heterogeneous population that are often beset with a number of often untreated chronic health conditions, mental health um, illnesses, and substance abuse problems. Um, so it is the, the very fact of incapacitation being taken out of your life often in unexpected ways. Um, the conditions of confinement themselves, which I just described, and, and this is something I will bring up a bit later, the use of these conditions by system agents to basically wring a guilty pleas um, from detainees that contribute to making pretrial detention such a dest destructive force in the lives of those who are captured um, in its web. Um, and this leads to a set of collateral consequences that a growing body of research makes very clear has both short and long term effects. What we've learned from recent research is that pretrial detention increases the likelihood um, in the US of conviction on one's current charges. And this again is in large part because the, the plea deals that are run from um, detainees who are hoping to get out of jail as quickly as possible and so are willing to do a lot in order to do in order 
to get that. Um, since many are being charged with misdemeanor offenses, um, they a lot of people assume that misdemeanors don't mean anything, won't have much of an effect. But what we're learning is that that is far from the uh, from from the case. Um, and so they are they are willing to make these plea deals to get out, and and this produces convictions on their records, which then have these long-standing effects. Um, this leads to more severe detention, leads to more severe sentences with conviction. It harms individuals' physical and psychological well-being, um, both what happens inside and then the impact that has on um, people once they are released. Um, it re reduces the likelihood of employment, um, reduces wages, reduces annual earnings, and it also increases the burden of legal financial obligations. And uh, the topic of my next book is about the way in which pretrial pre detention also increases the likelihood of future penal system involvement, which is what we're also finding. People are more likely to be arrested um, once, they, um, once they've spent any more than a day in pretrial um, detention, again, dramatically dramatically um, and, and all sorts of other uh, negative effects. And we're finding gr greater evidence of this. Um, and we found greater evidence of this um, uh, over the past, I would say, eight um, to nine years. Uh, so as an example of two of the, the, the consequences that um, occur, we have a growing body of research that shows that spending, um, a spending time in pretrial detention dramatically increases the likelihood that one will be convicted um, and that, um, that this conviction will be as a result of a guilty plea. Again, the guilty plea it tends not to be related to whether or not one has actually committed a crime. Usually people are trying to get out and move on with their lives. And so they're willing to do so um, by um, taking on a guilty plea for misdemeanor off offense, which they think is not so problematic. They learn later that it is. We found uh, 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 these relationships in work by Heaton and, and, and colleagues, Leslie and Pope, Stevenson and Dobie my colleague um, and, uh, and, um, and, um, um, uh, and his co-authors. So it, it has a dramatic uh, impact on case outcomes leading to conviction in cases where they likely would not. We also know that, um, that uh, through pretrial detention, um, there's an erosion of one's earnings and employment. And this is the case one to two years out, but even a longer period of time. Um, and Adobe, Yang, Yang, Golden and Yang, Golden and Yang find that this is in part because of the the. Uh, um, having taken the plea, people now have a conviction on their record and that makes it less likely for you to find work. And it also um, has a, a, an eroding effect on one's earnings as well. So this is just two examples of the, the kinds of collateral consequences. Um, I, I actually just described uh, what it is that this, this uh, um, diagram shows. With arrest um, comes detention, um, especially if you, you don't get out with bail, what it tends to lead to is a conviction in part because you're pleading in order to get out. You don't want to be in jail. It's such a horrible place. That conviction then has an impact on how the broader society treats you. Um, so do the benefits of pretrial detention outweigh um, detention's costs? Um, uh, so the answer, of course, is, is no. And we, we have a growing body of research that indicates that pretrial detention has huge costs to society that uh, make little rational sense if we think about um, the relatively low benefits that are associated with uh, pretrial detention. Dobie and colleagues found that the total net benefit of pretrial release. So if we were to let people go for the marginal defendant, this is a the defendant who um, uh, um, different judges might assess very differently, um, depending perhaps on how lenient or how harsh they are. This marginal defendant, if we were to release that person, we save anywhere between 55 and $100,000. <clears> by, uh, by um, engaging in this release process. Bauman also finds that the costs that are associated with pretrial detention, um, so these are costs, costs that are borne by the individual, the individual's families and by the broader society, um, end up having a major impact on um, society. If we were to multiply the economic savings per defendant, um, we would essentially save roughly seven, $78 billion um, per year as a result of um, engaging in smarter release of, of defendants than we do. 
Uh, and, and here, I won't go into to detail, but she essentially contrasts um, a, a, a process by which or a model by which we, we um, effectively, effectively release the people who are less likely to um, enter the system again um, and hold on to those who are probably most dangerous and more likely to recidivate. And we also, she compares that to a system where we would just release everyone, the universal release process. Both processes would get us far greater savings than the process we currently use um, in the US, generally speaking. But she finds that one where we are very careful about releasing most and holding on to a few who are the most dangerous, most problematic, would, would yield the, the greatest savings. But in the US, uh, bail reform is underway across in various states across the country. There does seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel, but I'll share with you why I, I think that there's reason to be concerned. Here's a map of bail reforms that are taking place across the US. I um, essentially have uh, six categories here. There um, are eight states in the country is a USS, of course, 50 states um, and the District of Columbia. There are eight states across the country that are that uh, are engaging in no reforms whatsoever. Um, notice that these are Northern Plains and in the South, um, which tends to uh, be far more punitive in terms of its approach approaches. Um, we have those states that are taking preliminary steps but haven't gotten very far. There, uh, there are roughly uh, 13 states that are in that stage, so not very far in the process at all relative to where some others have gone. Um, we have about a dozen states that have engaged in moderate statewide reforms. These are reforms um, that modify how cash bail is used in the state. Um, it is important to note here that the reforms that seem like they should modify how cash bail is used do not necessarily translate to significant impacts. And so, and so we label this one, um, this set of reforms as moderate. We have those um, um, states that have cities or counties where reforms have taken place, but statewide, not yet. Um, and then of course we have the states where there are these reforms that have taken place, um, but because of backlash, they have uh, uh, subsequent, subsequently reversed or limited the, the amount of reforms that have taken place. We've seen this happen in some of our largest states in New York, in California, this has been an issue in Georgia um, and also in New Hampshire. Um, huge issues once the reforms were passed. And so it led to uh, a bit of kind of retraction of some. And then finally, we only have three states in the, in the US that have engaged in significant statewide reforms that have essentially dramatically reduced, reduced the number of people that they're holding in our nation's jails um, on uh, um, with people awaiting case adjudication. So there we are moving forward, but, uh, but somewhat slowly, although there are a few states that are certainly in the vanguard. And I think um, the, the, the kinds of patterns that we're seeing emerging in those states give us um, uh, comfort in terms of understanding that it's not having any kind of impact on crime. Um, and it seems to be allowing people to le uh, go, go on, live their lives, take on their jobs, et cetera, without doing much, with, without doing much harm. Here's um, a, 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 a graph that I've created to show the percent of, of declines in pretrial populations and be very, very clear with no negative public safety effect. These are places where there's been these dramatic reductions, but we've not seen any movement whatsoever with regards to crime. I'm gonna start with the two middle, middle um, um, bars, Washington, DC. For the past 30 years, Washington, DC has, um, um, been in, has engaged in a kind of bail reform. Here, they released the overwhelming majority of people who are arrested into their system, um, essentially between 90 and 95%. They release, they hold on to those that they feel are the most dangerous. And what they have found over this three decade period is that it's had minor impact on crime and the overwhelming majority of, of defendants show up for pretrial detention. Philadelphia is much newer to this, to this kind of system, but here, Two, we're finding that after releasing roughly 90% of the folks who are um, arrested, um, their rates of crime have not budged um, and, and uh, the overwhelming majority of people show up to um, um, their court hearings. Um, there's a range across the board, but what we see is significant declines with, uh, with bail reform, no impact on, on um, crime. 
um, in no major um, increases either in the, in the percentage of folks who, individuals who are released who are engaging in new criminal activity. So I was asked to consider a set of questions. Um, first, um, the first was actually a statement that we had to speak to. I decided to convert it to a question. So do alternatives to pre-child detention mean less impact on individuals on the rights of individuals. Um, this is almost certainly the case. People um, uh, now have access to go back. Once released, there are a couple of things that I think happen which, which are very intuitive. If you have been released, you have um, the ability to fight your case. You have the ability to in invest in the kinds of efforts that can to improve your innocence if that is the case. What pretrial detention often does is to tie your hands in such a way that makes it difficult for you to engage in the process of your own defense. And so at the very least it allows you to, to engage in this um, really important set of activities and it tends to have a benefit. Um, people are much more likely to be able to put up evidence to show that they were not engaged in the act that, that they had been accused of and oftentimes uh, often enough these cases get dismissed. Um, there's also the ability to keep working, to keep um, uh, supporting your family, a whole host of other factors. Having an arrest does have an, have an impact on the rights that individuals have above and beyond whether or not they are um, held pretrial. But being released allows the freedom to, to engage in many of the activities that we take for granted um, until we lose that, that right. Um, the but is it, it comes from this. In places like California where there, there has been and San Francisco in particular, where there has been bail reform, they now release the overwhelming majority of folks that they um, that they arrest. What has happened is that they the overwhelmingly put those um, individuals on electronic monitoring. So these are people who have to, uh, you know, they have to get the, the one, there, there are a few issues with this. One, of course, they have to get the equipment that allows them to be monitored and they are asked to front, often front the cost for that, right? So these monthly costs that are associated with that, that ends up being a, a huge burden to those, especially since many of these people are again, poor, they're on the margins. The other issue is that when individuals, um, agree to be monitored um, electronically, they sign a form that says that not only are they um, uh, opening up their home, et cetera, to uh, um, search um, at random if, if possible, everyone in their household also opens them up themselves up to that search. So everyone in the household also says, I give you the right to come into my, my, my home and search it. And whatever is found doesn't just affect the person who um, is on pretrial detention or not, um, but it also affects other members of the family. So it ends up widening the net. This is San Francisco, one of our most progressive cities in the country. And so what they have done is to replace pretrial detention, which you know, you would want to celebrate fewer people are being held, they essentially de de uh, replace it with something that leads to a kind of detention in the home, but also in ways that um, makes it so that law enforcement have greater access and rights to the, the places where these folks live. Um, I don't know that I think that this is a, is a huge um, benefit. Um, to the, the individuals who are released from pretrial um, detention as bad as pretrial is because it actually increases the likelihood for future criminal justice system involvement. Um, and the other reason why this is problematic is that we know from, from what's happened at other sites that you can release people with minimal supervision ask them to check in every once in a while with phone call or face-to-face -face, face -face, um, um, brief meeting. We know that people stay out of trouble and they show up for their court hearings. So the kinds of practices that San Francisco is engaging in is completely unnecessary and really ends up being a, a, a huge burden on those who um, face these kinds of uh, um, uh, uh, charges or uh, um, uh, alternatives. So then the other question is, does judicial culture impact the use of alternative measures and how? I think almost certainly, although this might be changing, uh, especially with the, the kind of emergence of progressive prosecutors in a number of cities across uh, the, the country, uh, the, the, the thing that I think uh, the thing that comes to mind most, um, besides the obvious kind of culture of punitiveness um, that we have in the US and also the obvious low risk that, that um, judges uh, feel um, um, for fear that the, the kind of um, uh, unlikely uh, defendant will go out and commit some heinous crime, there's, there's the, the level of 
um, power and influence that prosecutors have in the system itself. And what this means is that prosecutors can use detention itself as leverage to get plea deals um, from respondents. So bail is so off, I mean, sorry, not bail. Detention is so awful uh, prosecutors essentially say, well, if you want to get out, here's the deal that will allow you to get out, even when there's often no evidence whatsoever to support the, the um, reason for why the person was uh, um, um, arrested in the first place. And so prosecutors will use the fact of um, incapacitation and also the conditions of confinement, as I said earlier, to wring plea deals out of respondents in ways that make it so that they don't really have to rely so much on alternative measures. They can get the outcomes they want because they know people want to get out as quickly as possible and put this put this behind themselves. So unless we do something to remove that, the, that kind of power and influence, that unbalanced power and influence, that prosecutors have, we will continue to get these kinds of outcomes in the US. And, and we, you know, we do um, um, with uh, uh, a few cases, a few differences across the, the country. And a final, set, uh, final question is what would you change in the way um, authorities approach pretrial detention and alternatives to limit negative impact on individuals and society? I think in thinking about um, how to respond to this question, I really think it makes sense to um, uh, um, to go upstream. Part of the problem is our system is so overwhelmed with so many people. I mean, imagine we're, we're essentially arresting about 13 million people every year on misdemeanor charges alone. This is flooding our systems, right? With, with an untold number of, of, of defendants. And so, it, you know, it in part makes it easy then to not think about the individual cases and really try to create uh, um, uh, uh, um, a, a system where you can just move people through almost as if it's a factory. So one of the things I think we absolutely have to do is to reduce arrests um, by decriminalizing a lot of behaviors that for the most part are more offensive um, than they are truly criminal. Um, and again, we I mentioned these progressive prosecutors that have emerged um, in various cities across um, the country and what they many are promising to do is to not prosecute um, a lot of up to upwards of 15 low level offenses, things that people get caught up for a lot, but that really don't um, um, have, don't pose a real threat to public safety. I think, and these end up being a significant minority of the reasons why people are being brought into the system. If we were to decriminalize these behaviors or fail to prosecute them or cite them and release them, I think we would um, 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 produce a lot better outcomes because you significantly reduce the number of people who are going into um, into courts and being processed. It means that judges, prosecutors you know, could rely less on heuristics and really pay attention to each of the cases that come before them. So releasing the volume, I mean, reducing the volume of people we bring into the system has to be part of this. I think it, it's, it's just critical to eliminate cash bail. That has been the major reason why we've seen the uptick that we've seen over the last um, three decades. It can be by eliminating it, we can we can go back to a rate that was probably still too high, but at least far more manageable, far more, far more humane, and far less of a burden to people who are too poor to pay. And I just want to say, even for those who are not too poor to pay, Many of those who come get out on bail are people who are getting into debt to do so. And it takes them years to come out of that debt. So, so you know, even if you can afford it, you put it on your credit card, you're out in a day or so. What I'm finding with my respondents is that it takes them three, four, five, ten years in order to be able to get out of that debt. And so we, we really have to take that seriously. That has significant impact on one's ability to maintain economic stability, to achieve mobility. Um, and indeed, I think what it often does is lead to uh, uh, um, some downward mobility for some subset of people who have to engage in these kinds of behaviors to get out of jail. Um, I think uh, we, as problematic as risk assessment tools have been found to be, to me, they are still more trustworthy than the kind of the, the, the decisions that judges make. 
um, I think Christina mentioned earlier how troubling it is to see um, um, how much judges vary in terms of the kinds of assessments they make on, on, often on very similar cases. What we're learning in the US is that um, um, within any system, judges can vary significantly in terms of how they respond to some subset of cases that, that where um, defendants look very similar in, in most ways. We also find that judges, each individual judge can vary significantly in their rulings contingent on who is in front of them. All things considered, the case looks the same, but if that person is black or brown, uh, male or young or whatever it might be, it impacts what, what how they assess the case, it impacts how high the bail is set, et cetera. Um, I think we need to move away from that. And I think one of the ways that we can begin to do so carefully, but still is through risk assessment tools. And this is one of the ways in which um, um, some municipalities have been able to reduce their, their, um, the number of people that they have in jail, deploying these risk assessment tools and um, allowing them to release um, numbers of uh, a huge percentage of folks. This is a case in New Jersey, <clears throat> for instance, provide greater support for pretrial defense. Um, I, I know that this is in part a, a conversation about culture, structure matters. We, to the extent that there's actually, um, uh, uh, um, a balance between the kind of the ways that we fund um, the defense and the way that we the fund the prosecution, I think it could actually produce far greater um, um, and more equitable outcomes. But in the US, defense is so poorly uh, funded that it actually becomes a joke. There's no real adversarial relationship here, prosecutors rule to the extent that we do this. And we've seen instances where this has happened and made a difference. It would basically change the system altogether and far more people would be released. And then finally, uh, I'm not always someone who thinks that huge education campaigns can make a difference, but it does seem to be the case that authorities don't understand how the collat how collateral consequences um, uh, accumulate on top of the, the rulings that they make, the sentences that they give. Um, and so to the extent that they understand this, it might shape how they, uh, how they rule on various issues. And so I think educating authorities about these collateral consequences consequences, including collateral consequences for folks who are detained pretrial um, for any more than a day, might shift how they view um, the decisions that they make for these individuals, um, um, given the impact that it does have on these individuals, their families, and communities. I think I, am, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Smith. Um, I was so... Um, so I was listening to your to your vivid and, and eye opening speech that I totally forgot uh, timekeeping, I must say, but I'm very sorry for that. And I hope uh, it's not a problem. I think uh, it was extremely interesting uh, to hear about the uh, US experiences. Uh, also some very worrying insights, I think. So I'm, I'm happy you ended with some positive notes. Uh, especially the, the what I especially liked was the, the that you pointed out the collateral consequences and the collateral effects of pretrial detention. I think these are very much are very often overlooked. And so taking this broader approach and looking at long term consequences is so important at the cost to individuals. And I think your, your speech made that very, very uh, clear. Uh, also, from from a Dutch perspective, I, I very much like the. Um, what you said about uh, about financial bill because we always like this opportunity very much and we don't use it uh, or hardly use it in the Netherlands but um, as you point out there are also many uh, negative effects uh, of bill obviously so I think much food for thought uh, let's continue to our second uh, speaker Professor Mary Rogan you have the floor thank you very much And good afternoon to everybody and a very uh, sincere thank you to our wonderful colleagues in Leiden and in Maastricht for organizing this wonderful set of events and I'm very delighted to have been invited and to have the opportunity to take part. And I send very warm greetings to you all uh, from Dublin. I'm just gonna set my, my timer. Uh, so what I'm hoping to talk to you today about is um, really uh, very much in response to the second question which our panel has been posed the influence of judicial and legal culture on decision-making when it comes to pretrial detention. And by culture, I mean 
the assumptions, the interpretations of the law and the approaches that people take towards decision making, which are shared amongst judicial actors and also, as we'll see in the Irish case, among other actors in the field, including prosecution and defence lawyers. I think Ireland is quite an interesting case to examine, not just because it's my home, but also because its pretrial detention rate is relatively low, as we'll see compared to its European neighbours. And it's my argument that it's the Irish legal framework combined with aspects of how legal practice operate in Ireland, which have shaped this position. And the Irish approach to sum it up is one which sees alternatives to pretrial pre detention as the default or the norm, rather than pretrial detention itself being the starting point in these discussions. And in addition to this, the risk of offending ground has not been very prominent in Irish legal practice, though it does exist. And I will consider what might be learned from this picture. At the outset, it's important I say a little bit about terminology. And the same issue arose yesterday uh, with Ed's wonderful presentation and um, also the, the term bail is used um, very much by Professor Smith uh, just now. In Ireland, much as with those two jurisdictions and it, probably in light of our common history, the term bail in Ireland is used to refer to the alternative to pretrial detention. It does not refer only to financial bail or financial guarantee. So the, the decision in pretrial detention cases is between bail and pretrial detention. Now that bail may have conditions placed upon it, but it's not an aspect of, pre, of alternatives, it's really the alternative. And in some ways, I think it's quite revealing that that's our starting point, um, that we use the term bail more um, frequently or with more fluidity than we use the term pretrial detention. So to give you a sense of where Ireland is um, in terms of its pretrial detention rate, um, currently our rate is about 14 pretrial detainees per 100,000 population, with the prison population rate of 83 per 100,000 population. The number of people sent to pretrial detention is shown here in, in red. It's been relatively stable in the last decade, but it is certainly higher than 20 years ago. And our pretrial detention rate has been creeping up slightly. So from about 12, five years ago to 14 now. Um, the orange line here is for people who have been sent uh, as part of a sentence to prison. The percentage uh, component of our uh, prison population as a whole, which is made up of pretrial detainees has also been uh, growing. Uh, that figure now for March this year is, is down to 18% again, but it's, it's, it's roughly hovering around that sort of 17, 18, 20% range. Looking at the legal framework for pretrial detention and its use in Ireland, Irish law on pretrial detention comes from a mixture of the Irish Constitution, which was passed in 1937 after Ireland obtained its independence from the United Kingdom. It comes from statute law and case law. And this legal framework starts with a presumption in favour of bail. People have a prima facie or on its face right to bail. Bail is not an automatic right, but it is viewed within the case law as an important part of the right to liberty and to the presumption of innocence. There are three grounds for pretrial detention in Ireland, so three bases on which pretrial detention can be required. The first one, not turn up for trial. The second is that they will interfere with evidence. And the third is a risk that they will commit serious offences. And there are various legal tests you can see on the screen for proving, um, when, uh, for proving one of those three grounds. May I ask Professor uh, Rogan, sorry to interrupt, but are you sharing your screen or not? Yes, can you not see it? I'm afraid not, no. Oh, goodness. I thought you were referring to... <laughs> oh, that's a pity. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. No problem. Let's see. Can you see now? Okay, well, oh, what I'll do is I'll just very yeah. quickly show you the two, the two graphs. Um, because they're probably the most it, it revealing parts where you can see the um, uh, the red line is pretrial detention rates and pretrial detention committals and the uh, orange line, the number of people sentenced and then 
this graph is the proportion of the prison population made up of pretrial detainees. So thank you very much for that clarification. Um, as someone who's not very good at graphs, I'm very happy to have the chance to show them. <laughs> Here are our three uh, grounds. So um, evading the, the trial, not showing up, interfering with witnesses or committing serious offenses if granted bail. Uh, one of the big influences on practice is a decision of the Irish Supreme Court in 1966 called the O'Callaghan decision. And this was a, a Supreme Court decision, as I mentioned. The key point of the case is that it held that pretrial detention to prevent offending was unconstitutional. And in the mid 1990s, after a period of moral panic about crime, a referendum was passed by the Irish people to allow pretrial detention on this ground. And this became the Bail Act of 1997, and it relates to serious offences which are defined in the legislation. They include murder, but they also include things like theft. So looking at that ground a little, in a little bit more detail, uh, under this section, which was a big change in Irish law, as I mentioned, for 30 years, it was unconstitutional to detain a person on the grounds of a risk of offending while, uh, while on bail or while waiting for their trial. Under this section, a court may refuse to grant bail. And again, I think it's notable that the language is may refuse to grant bail rather than must impose pretrial detention. If there is a real risk that the person will commit serious offenses on bail. So the person must be considered to pose a real risk of committing serious offenses. And the person must also have been charged with a serious offense. And that has a particular definition, including murder, burglary, theft. In making this decision, the court must consider the seriousness of the offence, the person's previous convictions, whether the person is addicted to drugs and the length of time until the trial. And in 2015, the law was changed again to try to make it less easy for people to get bailed for uh, burglary offences. So to explore the legal and judicial culture a bit more deeply and its influences, we were delighted to take part in a broader project, which uh, Christina mentioned yesterday, the Detour project. And as part of that, we conducted a small scale qualitative study uh, involving interviews with judges, prosecution and defense lawyers and staff of the probation service, as well as observations. And we wanted to explore what were the assumptions, ideas, and beliefs about decision-making on pre-trial detention, essentially? So what did we find? Well, it was quite a strong theme to emerge. It was very apparent across all participants, regardless of their background, that the legal and judicial culture in Ireland sees bail, so this alternative, as a default or, or the norm. So a person must be argued into pretrial detention rather than being argued out of pretrial detention, with some exceptions. Um, so it was clear that this culture acts as a barrier to the use of pretrial detention. It's a protective factor in, I think, in keeping the pretrial detention rate relatively low in Ireland. It was also apparent that the risk of offending ground had been more limited than may have been expected. And the constitutional position and the constitutional protections for bail in Ireland have influenced this position, have acted to restrain the impact of the use of the risk of offending ground. And as I mentioned, this, these aspects of the culture are shared across prosecution and defence lawyers and judges. And to illustrate this, I have a couple of, of quotes here that you can see. So a judge saying, first of all, that it's a serious thing to seek to deprive someone of their liberty and two things the judge must keep in mind. Number one, the presumption of innocence. Number two, the constitutional right to bail. And here I think we see the, the idea that this is kind of taken for granted in Ireland. That is the whole system and that's how it works. A prosecution participant telling us that there is obviously a constitutional presumption in favour of bail. And in this person's view that it's taken seriously by the judiciary. A judge got putting it quite directly saying, essentially it starts with the presumption that somebody will get bail. And another judge saying it's liberty, it's a valuable right. There's a very high presumption in favor of bail in Ireland and a very strong constitutional imperative 
that people shouldn't be a long time in custody pending their trial unless there is a good reason for it. We also see that the risk of tur not turning up for trial remains the dominant consideration in decisions on pretrial detention. It's the, um, the, the, the most relied upon factor. And you can see this again illustrated in the quotes. And this one I, I quite like um, uh, from a judge where I had explained that the interview may take about an hour and the judge replies later on, I know you said it's gonna take an hour, but in truth, I think it can be all done in 30 seconds. The be all and end all, like the start and the finish of bail in Ireland is the O'Callaghan decision. And that's the presumption in favor of bail. And it's to do with the, the two grounds of absconding and interfering with witnesses. A prosecution participant saying similarly, it's really, you know, someone who won't show up. That's who's not going to get bail. That's someone who goes to pretrial detention. I think that O'Callaghan is still the main game in town, says another, is the, the, main, uh, the main theme, the main idea. And a defense uh, practitioner saying that they didn't see the risk of offending Brown as having had a major impact. Um, I saying I couldn't say if there was any great changes over the years and I've been doing it for years now. So this was a widespread view that the risk of offending ground was not as dominant as might have been expected from the need for a big change, a change in the Irish constitution to allow it to be used. So what matters, and I think an important feature of the Irish position, and perhaps that is, that is something um, which speaks to question three and what might be uh, suggestions for authorities elsewhere, is that the focus is on the past. So the focus of the Irish approach is, is this person likely to turn up for trial? And to decide this, they look to evidence from past behavior. And this term bench warrants is important to explain because it comes up again and again. And um, when a person doesn't turn up for a court appearance or their trial, the judge may issue a warrant for their arrest. And the idea of the judge being at the bench, this is known as a bench warrant. And this is considered very important evidence of the likelihood of the person's, uh, of the person turning up for trial in the future. How many times have they not turned up in the past? How many bench warrants do they have? So here we see it here, a defense practitioner saying, warrant history, always warrant history, is the first question asked, how many warrants? But the first thing is always warrant history. And a judge saying, generally speaking, you're looking to the past. And this is more important, the, the record of turning up for trial is more important than their previous record of having, of previous convictions. Um, and the other two factors which were the most prominent were the seriousness of the charge and the length of time until trial. But the most important thing was their prior history on bail of turning up. Looking then at the, uh, the actors and the role that they play, what's very notable is that these aspects of legal culture, the presumption in favor of bail, the focus on turning up for trial, the looking to past history of turning up for trial as a way to guide the likelihood of whether the person will turn up for this trial. These features of the culture are shared across actors. Now, part of this is due to legal practice and legal training in Ireland. So it's notable, and it's not the case everywhere, that a, a particular type of lawyer called a barrister who mainly works in, in court could be in one case representing the prosecution and in the very next case representing the defense. And I think this matters. There's also a feeling from our participants that there is a quality between the parties and no side is dominant. And just to mention Professor Smith's point, um, that funded legal aid is a core feature of the Irish system. Um, and the vast majority of defendants will be in receipt of funded legal aid and have representation at least on a par, uh, on an equal standard with the prosecution. There was also evidence of prosecutorial self-restraint. The idea that the prosecution were acting as a filter or a buffer to the police view, which might be very much in favor of pretrial detention. So the prosecution regularly spoke, our participants regularly spoke of times where the police were very keen on pretrial detention, but they felt the evidence wasn't there. So they would say, no, we're not going to make the argument. 
And the defense practitioner uh, summed this up by saying, I think there's generally a good balance between the parties. Both sides are he heard. There seems to be enough safeguards to make it reasonably fair. And another notable feature is it's not unusual for there to be consent to the person being released prior to their trial. So the prosecution and the defense agree before anything happens with the judge that the person can be released. This is not an uncommon feature. And one final thing I should say is that judges um, don't, don't have a specific judicial training. Many of them have come from practice uh, as legal practitioners and may also have been representing both prosecution and defense at particular times in their career. So to address the question, the first question of whether um, alternatives are uh, less inhibiting of liberty. Well, I think that's obviously true, but it must also be borne in mind that the conditions which are placed on liberty can often be intrusive. And the Irish system may look from what I've, I've said as quite a liberal one, but it is not a binary decision between liberty and detention. Of course not. There are conditions on release which must be considered as gradations of liberty or degrees of restriction on liberty. The main conditions that are placed on people who are released are shown here. Um, financial guarantees are very, very commonly used. Um, now, it you wouldn't be unlikely to see enormous figures, but they can be significant for people of limited means. Um, so, so financial guarantees, either from the person themselves or from somebody who's acting on their behalf are very common. Uh, so are movement and residence restrictions. Curfews are very common. A mobile phone condition is very common. So to have a mobile phone, to have it in credit and to have it turned on all the time so that a police officer can ring you. It's also very common to see sign on conditions. So you must show up at a police station and record your presence. Uh, you also see drug and alcohol treatment conditions, but it's interesting that Ireland uh, not yet, maybe soon, does not use electronic monitoring in place of pretrial detention. And there's no formal role for the probation service or supervision of bail conditions. And that can be a problem, especially for young people. Uh, there was a feeling that sometimes conditions placed on people who are released pending their trial can be disproportionate with a, a probation, or a, excuse me, a prosecution participant saying, sometimes they're there for no real reason. And a defense participant saying, often it's a tick the box. They are just replied in a blanket way and there might be irrelevant conditions. And it was also notable that the defense is unlikely to object because the accused person is really keen not to be in detention. So, you know, loads and loads of conditions. They'll just say, yes, 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 fine, without really considering what the impact of those might be. And there were lots of examples of conditions like uh, be sober or don't drink alcohol for somebody who has an alcohol problem. Um, be polite was one of the most ridiculous conditions that we encountered. Just briefly in the time that I have left to touch only very briefly on two other aspects concerning people who don't hold an Irish passport. This was felt by our participants to add to the concerns that they won't show up to flight risk, but it was mitigated if they had a lot of ties to the state. And it was, there was a general feeling that if a person was an EU national rather than a non-EU national, they were uh, less likely to be detained in pretrial detention. Now, having said all that, uh, the figures indicate that the percentage of pretrial detainees who do not have an Irish passport are higher than uh, the percentage of, pre of um, total detainees in the Irish prison system who do not hold an Irish passport. And there's, there's a break in the series, that's, that's not, a, not a mistake. So what can be learned? And this might be my, my answer to, to question three, what would we suggest the authorities? The Irish experience, I think, suggests that the risk of offending ground may drive higher pretrial detention rates. And there's this tension between risk and predicting risk of future behavior versus looking at the evidence of the person's past behavior in terms of their record of turning up for court. Um, something that's very difficult to translate across boundaries is a culture which views liberty as the default and acts as a buffer to the use of pretrial detention. But something that might be more easy to um, implement is the efforts to create more equality between the actors, between the prosecution and the defense. And funded legal aid is an extremely important part of that. 
but also opportunities for prosecution and defence lawyers to share experiences and almost opportunities to train together so they see the other's perspective. And with that, I'll say thank you and uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rogan, for your very interesting uh, speech on, on the Irish system. And uh, coming from the Netherlands, I, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge on the Irish system, but I always look at it uh, with some uh, some jealousy maybe when it comes to pretrial detention because what I do know is what you you highlighted today that you know liberty is 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 the standard and pretrial detention is the exception and I guess for in the Netherlands it's the other way around um, unfortunately but also I, I very much like that you that you uh, stated um, and 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 that the decision is not simply on liberty the decision choosing between liberty or, or detention. And this also links to what uh, Professor Smith has said. I think it's all about balancing, uh, you know, the, the long-term consequences and looking at it from a more broader perspective. So very, very many thanks for your, for your interesting speech. So, and for taking such good care of time, um, which left me out of the, <laughs> out of the problems. Okay, um, so I give the floor now to um, our third speaker, uh, Dr. Hilde Wermink. Um, and we will deal with uh, questions uh, later. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me and see the presentation? Yes, perfect. <laughs> um, so first of all, um, thank you for organizing um, this wonderful series of webinars about pretrial detention. I think it's very interesting to see uh, scholars from different countries talking about pretrial detention. Um, I think it's a very important theme as well to talk about. So um, thank you for having me and uh, say something about the Dutch context. Um, I'm excited to talk uh, today about legal inequality in an international perspective. I conducted a study with uh, Mike Light from the United States on legal inequality. Um, we focus on different decisions within the criminal justice system, but for today I will focus on pretrial detention. Um, and before I continue, I think it is interesting to give some uh, background information about the Dutch context. And I think it is so interesting uh, to see so many differences between countries, but it is really clear also with the last presentation by Professor um, Rogan that the Dutch situation is really different. Um, in general, we have a high frequency of pretrial detention that is being ordered. Uh, so there are every year many people who are pretrial detained. Um, and it's not only absolute numbers, it is also relative to other countries that our prison uh, pretrial detention population is quite high. The grounds for pretrial detention are easily accepted by judges um, and alternatives to pretrial detention currently exist as conditions to a suspension of pretrial detention. Um, but alternatives are underused in the Netherlands, I would say. Uh, for instance, with regard to bail, Judges are reluctant to set bail conditions and in practice, such alternatives are hardly used. So to put it very briefly, um, pretrial detention is overused and alternatives to pretrial to pre detention are clearly underused. Um, so the focus of my presentation today will be on the question, are pretrial detention decisions different for nationals compared to foreign nationals? To study this question, we analyzed a 10% random sample of all persons who were uh, convicted in a given year in the Netherlands, uh, containing more than 18,000 um, defendants. Um, and we were also interested to see what the mechanisms were that explain any differential treatment of foreign nationals. And to try to identify these mechanisms, we interviewed several prosecutors and several judges. So uh, why is it important to focus on foreign nationals versus nationals? Um, up till a year ago, uh, we lived in a very globalized world where people uh, could easily travel, increase mobility, increased immigration, uh, and what we saw in our criminal justice system was more and more that people um, entered from different uh, backgrounds. 
So foreign um, people without a Dutch passport are, um, tend to enter the criminal justice system more often. And we know that broader patterns of stratification are often reflected in the criminal justice system. So it is interesting to see whether we would find legal inequality um, when it comes to pretrial detention decisions. Um, and I think what is also interesting here is that when we just refer to uh, non-nationals being overrepresented, that's actually not enough because we don't know whether um, foreign nationals commit other crimes or commit more crimes or have more extensive histories. And if this, if this could explain the overrepresentation or whether decisions are really different for foreign nationals. So we need empirical studies, but there is um, up till now, I would say a remarkable lack of knowledge. And what we know from prior work, um, a unifying theme I would say in prior work is that punishment decisions are susceptible to factors beyond legally relevant criteria. Um, and, and most prior work focuses on factors such as race, class, and gender, factors that tend to stratify within societies, leading um, Bosworth and Kaufman to conclude that most sociologists of punishment remain wedded to a nationalist vision of state control, one unaffected by growing transnational flows and mobility. And so what we wanted to do uh, was to examine whether uh, decisions about pretrial detention, but also decisions at the final sentencing stage were different for foreign nationals compared to nationals. Um, and I will now turn to some first results, um, the first quantitative results in our study. Uh, so what we found based on the quantitative data is that foreign nationals were clearly overrepresented in the um, receiving pretrial detention. So the pretrial detention ratio is 11% for nationals and 26% for foreign nationals. So of all the cases that a judge, um, that a ju judge sees, 11% of the nationals receive pretrial detention, um, while it is 26%, 26 percent, 26% 26 for foreign nationals. So foreign nationals are more than twice as likely uh, to be pretrial detained in the Netherlands. And I, I think maybe, I'm, I don't know, these figures might not be so uh, surprising because we also know that foreign nationals um, are different than nationals uh, with regard to other characteristics. Uh, what we found is that they are more often involved in serious or very se uh, severe crimes, uh, even though they are sentenced for really various types of offenses, we see that they are more often convicted for theft and drug offenses, and also that they are somewhat more often male and somewhat younger. So what we did is we controlled for these other uh, background characteristics to see whether uh, foreign nationals um, actually have a higher probability of receiving pretrial detention. And we found that compared to Dutch citizens arrested for similar conduct and with the same prior records, non-citizens are more likely to be detained pretrial. And the odds of detention are nearly three times higher for foreign nationals. And so this is after controlling for type of offense, criminal history, the number of offenses in case um, of a conviction, um, yeah, whatnot, uh, everything that was in the data we controlled for. Um, not only is it a significant factor, I would say it's also a very important factor because when we compare the effect of citizenship status, it is much more important than other social demographic characteristics and even more important than having a prior prison stint. Um, so it is not just a characteristic, I would say it's very um, a very important one um, that is really considered by prosecutors and judges when it comes to uh, deciding over pretrial detention. What I believe is also very important is that this does not only um, um, shows that there are differences in the pretrial stage, so in an early case processing stage, but it is also true that pretrial detention is very important for the final sentencing decision. <clears throat> 
So we found that pretrial detention substantially diminishes the likelihood of a non-prison sanction, meaning that um, this results in more prison sentences and that this uh, disproportionately affects uh, foreign nationals. So what we see uh, when we analyze the quantitative data is that foreign nationals are more likely to be pretrial detained, that citizenship status is really an important characteristic and that this also really influences the final sentencing decision. And that's also something that we found that foreign nationals are much more likely to be incarcerated um, than nationals. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but then the question uh, remains uh, what the mechanisms are. Uh, so how can we explain this overrepresentation? How can we explain that foreign nationals are more likely to be pretrial detained? And in order to identify some common themes, we conducted several interviews with prosecutors and with judges, and we identified a couple of mechanisms. Um, one mechanism is that prison uh, was, I think, by virtually all or a lot of uh, prosecutors and judges, sometimes as the only option or um, alternatives, for instance, to imprisonment, non-custodial sanctions were difficult or not possible. And because pretrial detention is only possible in the Netherlands when a prison sanction is expected, this leads to um, a higher likelihood of pretrial detention for foreign nationals. So a judge, for instance, said, for instance, said, it's a bit poor. If someone is a non-Dutch citizen, community service is not possible. Or it is difficult for non-Dutch people to do some working sentence or some learning sentence. So you see it, and most of the time we send them to jail. And in response to whether this led to more pretrial detention for foreign, um, uh, foreign nationals, a judge responded, yeah, I think so, because also in the options in the detention phase. You have less options. So that means as a pretrial judge, you al you're already thinking about what the options, what options will the final judge have in the end. And because the options are also less in that respect, pretrial detention is more likely to be given, I would say. Um, a second mechanism, and that also relates to what Professor uh, Rogan mentioned in the second presentation, is the link to flight risk. And flight risk was something that was referenced often by prosecutors and judges. Um, and from previous work that I conducted uh, together with others, we also know in the Netherlands that the risk of absconding is easily accepted when the accused does not have an official fixed residence. So a judge uh, mentioned, so yeah, unfortunately for those people, pretrial detention is a way to keep them in our influence, in our scope. The idea is that if we let them go in the pretrial phase, they are lost. We cannot find them back. For example, we have a lot of suspects from Eastern Europe, and if we let them go, they just vanish. So we're talking about pickpockets and small crimes. And that's also something that I think was interesting uh, during the interviews, but also for the small crimes uh, like uh, pickpocketing or um, uh, stealing in a shop, for instance, that pretrial detention was you know, well e easy, Im easily imposed it seemed. Um, and a prosecutor mentioned most of the time non-Dutch citizens don't have an address in the Netherlands. And we say when he stays in a country like that, we're concerned that he might go to that country and we can't get him back to the Netherlands. So he'll stay here. What I thought was interesting was also that pretrial detention was considered as a way to punish, um, as, a, as a possibility to actually punish, even though it was um, a decision before someone has been found guilty. A judge mentioned there are certain rules, at least in the EU, that if you're talking small crimes like max four month imprisonment, you won't get them executed in the Netherlands. At least you cannot get the person extradited to the Netherlands to have it executed. And then you see what happens is that pretrial becomes a way of punishing already. Um, and what I also think is interesting to mention is that when we investigated with the quantitative data, whether or not someone um, received a prison sentence, 
it didn't actually matter whether someone was from the EU or outside the EU. So this was also something I think interesting. Um, how important it is for the final sentencing decision is also shown by um, the following quotes. It is very double-edged because as soon as somebody has been in detention until the hearing, the judges will give him the prison sentence with the pretrial detention to count as served. And another judge mentioned, so and that's a situation nobody's really comfortable with, with, but it's the only way to do it more or less. So then it's not ideal, but that's the way it goes, that they get the time served in pretrial and then that's it. So it also seem it also feels that if it's that it's just a really efficient way of handling these cases, put them in pretrial detention and then giving a time served, and then yeah, uh, we solved we solved the case. And then finally, what we also um, noticed um, when we did the interviews is that maybe sometimes there was more this. Um, um, uh, frustration or, or um, yeah, I would say frustration, especially with those people who um, come from, a, from abroad with the sole purpose of committing crimes in the Netherlands. Um, and then the notion almost was um, there is nothing else but punishment. So we've heard things like it doesn't really feel like our problem. This person has to work very hard to convince me that I must be mild uh, to him or her. Um, so also with pretrial detention, it really feels um, uh, that sometimes it is the default, um, uh, that this is the way to handle these cases. And also the logic of punishment seems to change um, if we compare foreign nationals to nationals. Well, the whole idea of re-socializing a person in a way that has an assumption that it's possible that someone built up his life in a country. So if I have options to re-socialize through punishment, I wouldn't do it if he's a non-national. Another judge mentioned, so re-socialization plays le less of a role if someone comes here to commit a crime or who is leaving the country afterwards, the retrib retribution argument comes more to the front. And finally, the only thing then, what you want to do is keep those problems out of your country by punishing harshly. Um, so we see that um, some the mechanisms that we could identify is that, that judges and prosecutors sometimes see prison as the only option and that this results in more pretrial detention for foreign nationals. Of course, the risk of uh, the, the flight risk, the risk of absconding uh, result could result in more uh, pretrial detention for foreign um, foreign nationals. The pretrial detention is actually used as a way to punish these uh, these defendants, um, and that yeah, this notion of nothing else but punishment could also result in more uh, pretrial detention for uh, foreign um, nationals. So to conclude, um, pretrial detention. Uh, represents an early case decision where foreign nationals receive more punitive treatment. This ultimately yields a substantially higher likelihood of receiving imprisonment. And I would say that pretrial detention is not a means of last resort for everybody almost in the Netherlands, but especially for foreign nationals, uh, regardless almost of the, the offense that was committed, because we actually tend to see pretrial detention um, being used for relatively uh, minor offenses as well. So citizenship is an important marker of legal stratification. What I also think was interesting is that the uh, alternatives to pretrial detention or the non-custodial sanctions were um, sometimes um, um, mentioned as if they were not possible or difficult uh, to impose, but then the question is, uh, non-custodial sanctions are possible, but then the question is, are these possibilities not clear to judges or prosecutors, or do they just experience maybe too many practical hurdles to think about such um, alternatives to pretrial detention or incarceration? And of course, we also know that there 
this high caseload and that prosecutors and judges experience high time pressure. So it could also be that this is an efficient way to handle these cases. Um, so I will I will stop here. Um, so and and what I um, want to say uh, last is if we want to change this practice, we probably have to change culture. But I I feel it's that it's quite difficult how we should do this. And I think this came up in earlier presentations as well. So if there are some people who have <laughs> some excellent suggestions, I would be uh, happy to hear them for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Werming. And I fully agree with you that uh, there is need for change and it, isn't, it will not be easy, I think. Uh, uh, it was very interesting to hear your uh, your views on the Netherlands and the results of your research, especially the, the results when it comes to foreign citizens. I think this is often overlooked um, and the effects of, of pretrial detention on final sentencing as well. Um, I think you, you rightly pointed out that in the Netherlands, it's all about efficiency, uh, other than, for example, our Irish uh, colleague presented that, uh, Professor Rogan presented that it's very important in Ireland that defendants show up at trial. I don't think we really care about that when we decide on pretrial detention, at least it's not in, the, in it's, it may be in the back of our minds, but not in the front. Uh, it's all about, you know, taking a head start with the sentence. Um, so it's very different, I would say. Let's go to, um, to, the, to the chat, see which questions we received. Um, I think we can start with uh, a question that was put to Professor Smith um, by Christina. It is on the, uh, yes, she says in the US prison system is privatized to a great extent. Does this have a negative or positive role to play in prison conditions? Professor Smith, would you? To Happy that. to respond. Um, I do want to um, jump in and add that less than 5% of cases in the US go to trial. So what the prosecutors do essentially makes almost, uh, it almost eliminates completely the this um, idea that folks will go to trial um, by getting uh, defendants to plea. So in response to the question, um, uh about private prisons i want to show you something that I, a, a slide that i created for one of my classes and i'll try to be as quick as possible um hmm. sorry about this uh, i don't know why this is a problem for me now you Ah, okay, forget it. Um, so here, what I want to show you is that this is this is a growth in in, in prisons um, in the U.S. from 1925 on, and not surprisingly, around 1975 it starts to uptick because that's when we start. That's when mass incarceration really becomes a thing that we now talk about um, um, so much and study. So what you'll notice is this kind of light bluish greenish line that represents the growth in total prisons in the in the U.S., both state and federal. Um, the red line there is the growth in private prisons. So we talk a lot about the role that private prisons play and they have become more um, important in making sense of, of what's happening in the US um, penal system. But in some ways it gets overstated the role that it plays both, uh, it, the role that it plays in mass incarceration and it certainly doesn't play a huge, huge role with regard to jail populations. Now, um, jails are not prisons. Um, they typically are run by counties, um, in some cases cities. Um, and so, and owned, run, they're run and owned by, by them. Um, so it's, it's also not being impacted by the private system at this point. This is not to say it can go in that direction. Increasingly, we see counties turning over their probation and parole departments, for instance, to private contractors to run. We've not seen a, a huge move in this direction with regards to jails. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not possible. What I'm showing you with regards to what has happened with um, pretrial detention over the past 30 or 40 years is, is really a, a, an issue of what's happening um, as a result of state um, action, not as a result of the growth of, of private industry. Here's another way to look at um, 
these figures, the overwhelming majority, even as we increase, um, is still focused on state run um, and own prison populations. Um, be because there was a question about juveniles, is it okay if I just jump to that? I happen to have a slide yes. here too. Um, there's been a dramatic decline um, over the past 20 plus years in the number of youth that we're holding in facilities, generally speaking, juvenile facilities in particular, um, with regards to juveniles who are being held in pretrial detention, about 3,500 juveniles are being held in adult jails. Um, and so we can, we can, we should expect that uh, uh, the majority of those will also be um, juveniles who are, uh, have yet um, to be um, convicted of anything. The, the, the rate is relatively small, um, but it still is a, a number that we, we would want to see um, decrease over time. So I just wanted to point out what is happening with regards to both the juvenile uh, system, but also with, re with regards to the role of the private prison industry um, and, and jail or pretrial detention. Many thanks for that, many thanks for that. Um, so you, you dealt with the question on, there were two questions on uh, juveniles, I think they are being dealt with now. Um, I also saw another question, uh, Professor Smith, uh, on what type of alternatives to detention are these states putting in place? And I think this was at the time you were showing the slide on the different states and the different percentages. Yeah, so it, it, it varies significantly depending on what um, a state um, and even city or county that you're in. Uh, so for instance, if we were to start in the Western part of the country, San Francisco, et cetera, has moved to uh, electronic monitoring and a number, number of places are doing that. New Jersey on the other coast um, has been engaged in um, mostly uh, limited supervision release. The overwhelming majority are released on their own recognizance. Um, um, they have little supervision. They're reminded about when their co court dates are so that they can come. It turns out just giving people reminders increases <laughs> people's uh, likelihood of showing up. Um, for those who are deemed to be uh, at greater risk, there's, uh, and, and that represents about five to 10%, there is increased supervision. Um, so those folks do have to show up to probation, uh, probation departments to show their face, get tests, whatever it might be, drug tests, et cetera. Um, uh, what other, uh, yeah, besides the electronic monitoring and vary, varying degrees of supervision, that really is what we're talking about in terms of alternatives in, in the US. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I saw that Professor Rogan was very quick in answering the questions, I think, in the chat. So many thanks for that, that's very helpful. Um, so there are two questions left, if I see it correctly. There's a question by Professor Smith to uh, Professor Wermink. Do you have rates of pretrial detention in the Netherlands, both over time and relative to other countries? And I think we can combine it with Christina's question, uh, which is also to uh, Professor Wermink on uh, whether EU nationals are treated differently than other third country nationals. So, Dr. Wermink. Yes. Um, I just was looking for some uh, some numbers. Um, I, I don't have the numbers over time, but uh, what I know uh, or what I found is that um, um, there is a varying use of pretrial detention in Europe in different countries. Um, and here it's it it's, uh, was mentioned that 12.7% of all detainees in Ireland have not yet been convicted. So almost 13%. But in the Netherlands, this is almost 40%, so 39.9. Um, so, and I think in the Netherlands, this is really, um, um, so it, this is really important pretrial detention. It's really a way how we handle cases. Uh, pretrial detention is used often. Uh, what we see also in, a, in another study that I conducted is that um, many uh, times this also results in a time served. So when a sentence is imposed, uh, someone just, well, just gets a, um, gets a time served. And this also leads to a situation in the Netherlands where we have many very short prison sentences. So I would say that um, I'm not, I, I don't know this um, by heart, but maybe um, like 60 or 80% or something is just three months or um, six months of imprisonment. But so long, long prison terms are really rare in our country. 
Um, so yeah, I, I would say that this is a really important mechanism um, in our country. Um, over time, I, I'm sorry, I cannot show you, but um, yeah, this gives, I, I think, a little bit more context, a little bit more of an idea of uh, how we use pretrial detention. Um, and then there was this question uh, by Christina, whether EU nationals were treated differently than other uh, third country nationals. Um, and we uh, distinguished between um, EU countries and non-EU countries uh, when we studied the incarceration decision in our uh, study. And we actually didn't find any differences. So it didn't seem as if um, uh, those in the EU were treated differently than non-EU, even though um, law and, and regulation is, is different. Um, so I would say it's it's more really more a matter whether you have a Dutch passport or not um, than it is where you come from. Um, and also we also included, for instance, uh, country of birth in our analysis. Um, and when we so we studied many different decisions, but overall, citizenship was much more important than country of birth. And for the pretrial detention decision, country of birth didn't even matter after controlling for citizenship status. Um, so I think that this is also quite interesting because some of the earlier studies, some that I conducted myself, uh, focused on um, first generation immigrants, second generation immigrants. But now when we um, try to tangle, tease out this effect a little bit more, it, it really seems to be, um, more an issue of citizenship status than it is um, of a country of origin. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Wermink. Um, I think we are nearing the end of the webinar. Uh, so many thanks for all contributions. Very, very interesting, much food for thought. And I will give the floor to Adriano. Yes, many thanks, Doris, and many thanks to uh, all the speakers for their fantastic contributions to today's uh, webinar. It was a great pleasure to uh, to have you all, and um, with this, I would also like to uh, thank, uh, from the deep of my heart, also all the speakers that contributed to the uh, successful organization um, of these three wonderful days of debates. Um, just a few words to briefly wrap it up um, and sort of cast uh, a way uh, forward, basically. Um, I guess we should begin by saying that um, we started these three days of debate by posing the question of uh, the causes, of what are the causes of the overuse of pre-trial detention. So we basically start about from the assumption that there is consensus that um, uh, pre-trial detention is being overused uh, from both a quantitative and a qualitative point of view because of the personal and social impact that the privation of liberty has uh, at the pre-trial stage. And we heard uh, something about that uh, during today's presentation uh, with respect to the collateral consequences that uh, uh, this form of detention has. Um, and the findings of these three days of debate actually uh, confirmed some of our concerns. I would add, unfortunately, and I would, all, uh, I would only like to point out a few aspects that, that, uh, that came out. So first of all is that the resort pre-trial detention um, on preventive grounds contribute, uh, contribute significantly to the overuse of pre-trial detention. Um, and this use of pre-trial detention is increasingly similar akin to you know, some form of preventive detention for public protection. Uh, and there's also the component of the risk of flight from foreign suspect that we also heard about uh, in the last presentation, which results in more detention as a sort of anticipation of punishment. Uh, but we also heard, uh, especially yesterday, about the gigantic role played by decision making and the fact that many, many judges still rely heavily on heuristic thinking. And part of it boils down to the great deal of ambiguity about how to weigh factors like uh, risks uh, with other factors like the impact of pretrial detention on the right to liberty. Um, but we also heard about the importance of 
taking uh, judicial culture into account and the implications of having um, uh, liberty instead of detention as a default option. So uh, all of these could be summarized as a long list of grievances, basically, about the current state of things uh, around pretrial detention, the cahier de doléances, like the French would say. But there's also a glimmer of hope, uh, uh, I guess, that, that comes out uh, from most of the presentations that we heard in these three days. Um, and some presentations actually show that bail reform programs and uh, programs of reform of pretrial detention, uh, for instance, in places like California, have led to a decrease of prison population uh, and especially to uh, a reduction in the share of pretrial detainees. Um, but I guess uh, more generally, and to conclude, I guess we should not forget to look at the broader picture and the importance of embedding, of incorporating uh, bail reform programs, pre-trial detention reforms within a broader um, design of uh, reform of, of, of um, um, criminal procedure. And we heard, among other things, about the importance of ensuring uh, and funding uh, adequate legal aid, um, especially at the pre-trial stage of criminal proceedings. Um, and so I guess, in other words, uh, all these three days of very productive and fruitful discussions show uh, that